This voiceover PowerPoint module continues a discussion of the cytoskeleton, focusing on actin, or microfilaments, with particular attention to the role of actin in skeletal muscle contraction. Muscle is an example of highly organized cytoskeletal elements, which include not only actin, but the very much thicker filaments called myosin. Between the two of them, thick and thin filaments, or myosin and actin, uh, these use the chemical energy of ATP hydrolysis to generate force, in other words, to not only contract, for a muscle, in other words, to get shorter, but that that contraction is able to generate force, for example, to lift a weight. So we're going to look at the interactions of actin and myosin filaments, the thin and the thick filaments, and ATP, and we're going to discover a paradox. So here we have a muscle bundle, which is basically the muscle that you would give a name, like uh, biceps, right? The muscle is surrounded by a membrane or a sheath, and inside the sheath is this bundle of muscle cells called myofibers. And myofibers are actually multinucleates. So you're looking at, in about the middle of this picture, a muscle cell, a muscle fiber, with multiple nuclei. A cell with multiple nuclei is called a syncytium, and these kinds of cells form when normal cells within one nucleus each merge. Their membranes disappear and you get one much larger cell. And this happened during embryonic development of muscle cells in our bodies. Now, in that cell is in turn a bundle of myofibrils. And this is the contractile apparatus of muscle cells. And if you look at the bottom of the illustration, we see some components of the myofibril, which we will revisit in a different picture momentarily. If you look in a light microscope, or a polarizing uh, light microscope even better, you can see the myofibrils that form striations or stripes. If you look at thin slivers of uh, body muscle containing multiple cells, the muscle and the cells will appear striated in the microscope, and that's because of the cytoskeletal components, in particular actin and myosin, as well as proteins associated with those. So in the bottom picture, we can see the thin filaments, the actin filaments, interdigitating with the thick filaments or the myosins. Electron microscopists looked at skeletal muscle, both relaxed and contracted. They came up with a mechanism of contraction that involved the sliding of these actin and myosin filaments past one another. So what looked like interdigitating actin and myosin in the cartoon moments ago would be seen to slide past one another during muscle shortening or contraction. This is a very high-powered, high-resolution electron microscope picture through a uh, sarcomere, a contractile unit of a myofibril, in its relaxed state. Let's look at a contracted one. So we have a relaxed and a contracted sarcomere. And you can see that the contracted sarcomere is shorter. We can identify what's called a Z-line. That Z comes from the German Zwischen, which means between. So it really means the line between consecutive sarcomeres. And what you should see is that the Z lines have come closer together in the sarcomere of a contracted muscle. Contraction is in effect pulling uh, Z lines closer together. The actin, the thin filaments, can be seen in this illustration as the lighter region of the sarcomere. And if one looks at even higher power and resolution, you can see the 10 nanometer fibers, which are actin filaments. They constitute together something that was called the I-band. In a sarcomere, there are two I-bands at either end, representing actin filaments projecting into the sarcomere from the Z-line. I say it that way because, in fact, we know that the actin filaments are actually attached at the Z-line. So they do project inward to the sarcomere from the Z-line. The dark material, when looked at fairly closely, turns out to consist of thick filaments and interdigitated thin filaments, and that region is called the A-band. The width of the A-band is the length of myosin filaments. The darkest region of the sarcomeres, and there are two of them on either side of a, of a middle band, is the region where actin and myosin overlap. And that's what you would expect. If the actin and myosin overlap, it should look thicker or darker in the microscope than where actin sits alone, or towards the middle of the sarcomere, 
in the relaxed state, certainly, where the myosin filaments are not associated with actin. The overlap region, when you look at it in cross-section, shows that each myosin, the thicker dots, is surrounded by six actin filaments. I mentioned a second ago the middle line or mid-region of the sarcomere. You can see that the middle region is present in both relaxed and contracted skeletal muscle. And then there's a region in the relaxed muscle called the H zone. And by now you could probably figure out what that is. That's that middle line, the myosin that is not interacting with or overlapping actin. And as you can see, if you look at the contracted sarcomere, the H zone has been virtually wiped out except for the midline or middle line. Now that's an explanation of all the bands and zones that you saw in the cartoon. Let's talk a bit now about the skeletal muscle paradox. Contraction, the shortening of those sarcomeres, as well as relaxation, the pulling apart of those Z lines and therefore or stretching of a muscle, also requires ATP. Let's take a look at some of the early experiments in which this paradox was first identified. You can soak a muscle in glycerin, and it uh, permeabilizes membranes, so it's no longer selective, and all of the smaller molecules in the cell can diffuse out. And you leave only contractile filaments. I don't have the pictures to show you, but if I were to do electron microscopy on glycerinated muscle fibers, you would see the actin, myosin, and Z lines much the same as we just saw them a moment ago. In this illustration, a glycerinated muscle has been suspended and a weight, a little black box, has been hung at the bottom end. If you add to this cylinder ATP, you can first of all watch it get hydrolyzed and the reaction proceed to equilibrium. And in the process, the muscle has contracted and was strong enough to lift the weight. Now, if you were to go in with a pair of tweezers or, or your fingers and try to stretch that muscle back to the relaxed length, you would find that it can't be done. That state is much like rigor, as in rigor mortis. So you know that when an animal dies, especially if it dies in a contorted position, if you later try to straighten out the muscles, you can't. In fact, what happens is uh, you have to cut the muscles, you have to tear them in order to straighten them out. In other words, get to look like they're more relaxed. That's rigor mortis, and that is the equivalent status of the muscle in this middle illustration. If you add fresh ATP back to this cylinder, you would at first see nothing happen. The cylinder would look just like the one in the middle of this illustration. But if you were to try to stretch that muscle shortly after adding the ATP, you would find that you could do it. If you waited a little bit longer, and when the ATP is consumed, used up, when the reaction reaches equilibrium, and there's no or not enough ATP to hydrolyze, the muscle will have recontracted and the, and the weight will remain elevated. But as soon as you add ATP, and for as long as ATP is still there, the fiber can be stretched. So obviously that implies that you need ATP in order to stretch, i.e. to relax a muscle. And that's what the conclusions here are. ATP hydrolysis seems to be required for contraction, but ATP is also required for relaxation, to stretch the muscle. And that's the paradox. All right. Early assumptions that one might make from a sliding filament or model for contraction, a model in which shortening of sarcomeres is presumed to be due to actin sliding against myosin, would lead to some predictions. Uh, specifically during contraction, thick and thin filaments should bind to one another. That makes eminent sense if you're going to use that sliding to pull the Z lines closer to one another. Clearly, you would model the role of ATP in fueling the sliding of the filaments, because after all, the sliding of the filaments and the contraction of a muscle is a form of motility that would require free energy. And given what we know, and given the paradox, you would also have to put into your model that ATP should cause actin and myosin to come apart. How was this eventually shown? Well, it began with an attempt to separate or fractionate muscle cells into their components in order to see how the components interact. In other words, dissecting the sarcomere. And in the process, purifying actin, or at least partially purifying actin and myosin. So you start with skeletal muscle, 
You homogenize it, you do a little extraction, begin to purify proteins one from another, spin, meaning centrifuge, to separate parts based on mass. Look in the electron microscope. And what you find are two fractions, one containing actin on Z lines, and the other containing thick filaments. In fact, they are the thickness predicted for myosin. So we have separated actin and myosin, although the actin is still associated with those Z lines. We've talked about reconstitution as a theme in cell and molecular biology research. So if we've taken these two things apart and we want to know if they are reflective of what they originally looked like an intact muscle, we need to put them back together and see if they can do something that is muscle-like. So we reconstitute Z-line actin complexes with these thick filament preparations. And when they're mixed together under the right conditions, they reassemble. And if you look in the electron microscope, lo and behold, it looks for all the world like sarcomeres. I'm not labeling anything here, but you can tell what the Z lines are. They're the vertical lines, and the actin are the thin filaments coming off and projecting into a sarcomere. And they have already interdigitated with the myosin, the thick filament. So we've demonstrated that actin and myosin do act bind, so that was one of our predictions, and that turns out to be true. Now, look what happens if you add ATP. Let's do that again. You add ATP, and it is hydrolyzed, and the sarcomeres shorten. And you can actually do this with a preparation of self-assembled sarcomeres, and then look at the results in the electron microscope as well, and see the shortened sarcomeres. So we can now uh, say that contraction does indeed require ATP, and in the process of uh, ATP is hydrolyzed. We have one other component. We said that in order that the sliding filament mechanism explain contraction, it also has to explain relaxation. That is, the binding of actin and myosin has to be reversed at some point in order to relax a muscle. Otherwise, the muscle is in rigor, right? Here's how it was done. You could add ATP to these contracted, I use the word in quotes, contracted sarcomeres, add the ATP back, but this time vigorously agitate. Put them in a vortex machine or sonicate them. Do something to keep things moving in the presence of ATP. And the Z-line actin complexes come apart from the thick myosin filament. Again, you can see this in the electron microscope, from which we can conclude that ATP is indeed required for actin and myosin to separate. So, summarizing, we can conclude that the thick and the thin filaments, the myosin and the actin, do bind during contraction, and that ATP is needed for contraction and for the dissociation of actin and myosin at some point. It turns out that ATP hydrolysis does indeed supply energy for contraction, but exactly when in the process of sliding of filaments this happens remain to be worked out, and we'll see that in the next module in which we look at how this in vitro equivalent, this uh, cell-free model of contraction, permitted us to do experiments that ultimately resolve the paradox. That brings us to an end of this module.